Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the WellBe Show and Podcast. I am very excited about this topic today and my guest, Dr. Aviva Ram, is with me. This is actually the first WellBe repeat expert, I think, that we've had, which is very impressive. I normally like to get lots of different people, but she just is such a wealth of knowledge and a friend and just a wonderful person. So I'm thrilled to have her back. Um, Aviva is a midwife and an herbalist and happens to be also a Yale trained MD and board certified uh, family physician with specialties in integrative gynecology, obstetrics, and pediatrics. She is also the mother of four and the grandmother of two. So she really knows what she's talking about as far as hormones and reproductive stuff and children and all of that. So Aviva, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me back. I didn't know I was your first repeat guest. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So the first time that you were on the show and podcast, we talked extensively about thyroid hormones or just all things thyroid, because you wrote a wonderful book that I actually use myself called the adrenal thyroid revolution. And, uh, today, actually, I want to talk about hormones because you wrote another fabulous book that just is coming out now called hormone intelligence. And it was just such a rich resource on hormones that I thought it'd be great to have you explain it to my audience because somehow I've never had an actual interview about hormones, even though they're mentioned constantly. (laughs) That's amazing. So your book explores the impact of the world we live in on women's hormones and health. It also brings us a new medicine for women that is at once holistic and natural, but also grounded in the best that science and medicine has to offer. So first question for you, what are some of the biggest misconceptions or misunderstandings that you find people have when it comes to hormones? You know, I've really been reflecting on this lately. And what has really struck me is this idea, like this deep belief that women's hormones make us irrational and unpredictable and somehow unstable in some ways. I remember my daughter's boyfriend, I don't mean to call him out, he's a great guy, but when they were first together, she is not a morning person usually. And we were in the kitchen, they had spent the night and she came down to the kitchen and he's an early morning person. I'm an early morning person. He's like, good morning. And she's like, rrr, rrr. and he said, are you on your period or something? And I was just like, punched him in the arm. I was like, dude, <laughs> first of all, if you want a relationship to last, don't say that. And second of all, in my house. <laughs> so we had this kind of talking to you about like that concept, right? Like if a woman is in a bad mood, if, if we're feeling something, it's our, we blame our hormones, but really women's hormones are very predictable. Like Most of us start menstruating around a certain age. Estrogen and progesterone do very predictable things. Testosterone does very predictable things. Getting pregnant hormones do very predictable things. Menopause, they do predictable things. So I really want to dispel this idea that hormones make women unpredictable or that hormones themselves are unpredictable because they're not. So that has been kind of a fun and exciting myth to explore and debunk because it's really everywhere. I mean, if you think about like, I'll just say a president who said to a reporter when she challenged him, um, what do you have blood coming out of your whatever? And just these kind of things like, what are you hormonal? It's become an insult rather than us seeing this as a really important superpower. And through the book, I explain how our hormones can be a superpower that we can actually lean into for really important information. Yes. I I have had experiences like that myself where even, you know, culturally women to women, we do that. I think not just men to women, but when I. It's so funny because um, I've always had very regular periods and I never really had PMS, fortunately. And then as I was heading into menopause, I would notice that always like a week before my period, I would have this fight with my husband. And I was like, I don't, I don't know like what you're doing, babe. And then I realized what it was is that I was having a very predictable one day a month when my hormones were doing something that it was almost like, it wasn't that my hormones were making me irrational. It was that my hormones were dropping my filter on what was actually bothering me. And I was expressing it in a more exuberant way. It was actually quite predictable and it was very 
uh, consistent. And to me, so even when there is emotionality or even rage, you know, even looking at that for information, where is that coming from? Why is that happening? What is actually coming up for us rather than just dismissing it as I'm just hormonal? Yeah. Being pregnant, I had that experience in the first trimester of having more severe uh, emotional reactions to things that were real though, you know, things that were obviously deep seated fears and anxieties and things. And like you said, not irrational, but you know, maybe my emotionality was, you know, higher or lower than it, it would have been. And I had the same, like, I just can't explain it. It must be the hormones, you know, instead of and understanding that no hormones are predictably going to make things a little bit higher or lower. Absolutely. Uh, and you know, it's really interesting with pregnancy. I have four kids too, is that there have been really clear studies done showing that even though it feels almost irrational or unpredictable as you're going through it, there are actually predictable emotional upheavals that occur by trimester across women almost universally. So for example, a common fear that women kind of almost get stuck on or perseverate on in first trimester is something happening to their partner. And then, you know, like this intense need to be around their partner. And then later on in the pregnancy, there are fears about something happening to yourself or to another child. If you have, and then the fears about becoming a mother. So they're, they actually, even though they seem really heightened and there's, there can feel like an irrationality to it, it's also really predictable. And also when we look at hormonal expression and how it affects us, it's also very culturally specific. In cultures where women have that community and connected support, they don't necessarily go through those extreme emotional shifts that women here might go through. Or in a culture or community where there's red tent, you know, where women can get together and be in a sacred, calm, quiet space when they're menstruating rather than showing up in a corporate boardroom. And it's not that we can't kick ass in a corporate boardroom. And studies have shown that we don't lose any intellectual or academic capacity premenstrually, but it's not necessarily what we want to be doing. We want to be gathering with our sisters and sitting on the earth or maybe just sitting on our sofa and watching Netflix, not competing in a man's world. And so I think that even some of the symptoms that we get around PMS or period pain, I, I often wonder, would they be different in a different context that allows us to be more supported in those natural phases in our life cycle? So this is one of the big things that I'm exploring just in my work, but also I don't spend you know chapters and chapters on it in the book, but I do touch on it because I think it's really important to understanding how we reframe our own stories about our hormones and our bodies, our bodies in general and our gynecology and our body parts and our, all the things that come with it, whether it's periods or discharge or sex drive or lack thereof, you know, really going deep into all of that. Yeah. I think the whole idea of like, okay, well, it's not like we're not going to have hormones or not going to have cycles. Let's use these experiences to become more intelligent to then, you know, thrive or, repair or whatever it is that we want to, you know, feel as we go through our lives instead of fighting against it or being surprised by it or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So what are the, some of the most common ways that our hormones may be thrown out of balance? Um, and what are some indications that our hormones may be out of balance? Because I think a lot of people are told, oh, that symptom, that could be result of hormonal imbalance. And you're like, well, yeah which hormone is out of balance and how out of balance and how would I tell that? And I'd love no, to know what really you important to say question. about that. And, you know, so many women um, that I see don't know much about their cycles. They don't know much about their body parts, um, don't know how their hormones work or really what hormones are. So one of the things I do in the book is say, okay, this is actually what's normal because we don't know, right? We're told, Oh, you know, blowing through a box of pads or tampons, you know, every day of your period, that's normal. Women have heavy periods or being doubled over in pain or needing to pop Motrin or Advil or whatever it is to just show up at work because you're so uncomfortable. That's not normal. We shouldn't suffer. Just like I say in the book, being a woman is not a diagnosis. You can't just say, oh, this is happening because you're a woman. But we've so, as a culture, from medical doctors to our mothers to ourselves, 
oh, well, that must be normal. So there's some aspect of me saying, okay, well, this is actually what's normal. So if you're having a little bit of this or a little bit of that, you don't need to worry about that. But here's where it's not normal anymore. And here's how to know. So it's actually like symptoms and checklists and, um, and it's, you know, it's hormones, but it's also like, polycystic ovary syndrome, endometriosis, fertility challenges, fibroids, all the things that get packaged into hormone imbalances, which are sometimes more complex than just our hormones. So the book and, and my work in general just allows a, a person to find where they are in that spectrum of what's normal to what you shouldn't have to live with because it's not just normal. I'm not saying the person is abnormal, but like, no, you shouldn't have to live with that. Like there's, there are reasons and there are solutions. And then I start to unpack, um, you know, much of what I have done as an integrative functional medicine doctor, which is look under the hood. It's not enough to just give somebody a diagnosis and send them home with a prescription for a birth control pill or, you know, just take Motrin or have a sur surgery. And even if that's what a woman wants, I still think it's not responsible to put someone on a lifetime of, you know, hormones or, or uh, pain medication. And I have women come to me, I'm, I'm sure, you know, you've had conversations too, Adrian, of people who got put on the pill when they were 13 or 14 because they had irregular or painful periods, which may have, the irregular periods may even be normal at that age. And then they're 32, 34 coming off the pill for the first time since they were a teenager and struggling to get pregnant because nobody ever addressed what was really going on leading to those hormone imbalances. So my job is to, you know, with my patients is to go under the hood and unpack what we can of what we know. So we know, for example, that um, polycystic ovary syndrome, and we don't hundred percent know why it happens in some women and not others. There may be a genetic predisposition, but what's flipping the switch to activate those genes in some women and not in others. And we know microbiome disruption, specific dietary um, patterns, stress, high cortisol, lack of sleep, for example, or we know with endometriosis, there's an immune dysregulation component. So giving someone the pill, it may be really helpful. It may be really provide amazing symptomatic relief, but it's not addressing the inflammation or the underlying immune system problem. And here's the reason that's so important to do and not just put a Band-Aid on it, even if that Band-Aid makes you feel better, we know that our menstrual health, our gynecologic health, is what has now been called a sixth vital sign. So we have our temperature, our blood pressure, our heart rate, our respiratory rate. Pain is considered the fifth vital sign, and women's cycles are considered the sixth. So we know that these conditions and symptoms and imbalances that show up can impact us later on in life because those same things like inflammation or microbiome disruption or insulin resistance can then show up later in other ways. I've, so, I've said that to a number of, of women who talk to me about these exact issues that we are so lucky because men don't have a monthly reminder that something might not be quite right, that they can exactly. deal with way before they're in their you know later years and then have a full-blown chronic condition. We get an, an opportunity to course correct like every month and see how you're exactly. doing like a little scorecard. So yeah, even so though it so seems worse to be a woman having to deal with these things, this extra amount of intelligence or signs and symptoms from your body are super helpful, I think, to avoid something yeah, exactly. much worse later. And, you know, when we start, when I was talking earlier about some of the predictability that we see with how our cycles work, and it's not just our menstrual cycles, it's like through our life cycles, whether it's entering puberty or entering pregnancy or going into menopause. Um, but within that, there is also a predictability that we can look at when imbalances show up. So for example, if a woman has have really, you know, really achy boobs right before her period and gets menstrual migraines, um, has really heavy periods, we can then say, oh, check, check, check. Those are signs of excess estrogen. Or someone is not ovulating, they're having really short cycle. Or let me back up and say they're checking their basal body temperature and they're checking their cervical mucus and they're checking their, like checking in with how they feel and they're like, yeah, I'm not getting that peak in temperature that you're supposed to get when you're ovulating and my cycles are irregular. And that tells us very specifically without any lab tests, oh, there's something going on with progesterone 
or by definition, if you're not ovulating, your progesterone is low. So there's so much we can do just again with that, like peeking under the hood, having a little bit of body literacy and paying attention, like just actually paying attention to the wisdom that our body offers and then comparing it to information that you can find in your book or on the internet or you know any number of places where you can find good hormone information. What I'm hearing from you is sort of more of a sort of like a symptom checklist or helping to self, not self-diagnose, but but learn about what these symptoms are. And then with enough of them, you can say, okay, like this sounds like endometriosis, PCOS, insulin resistance, these sorts of exactly. different things. So because a lot of people come to me and say, do I need a hormone test or somebody that's going to order me a hormone test? And I say, it's different for everybody. And so I'm curious what you think about that. Cause I've had one done the, the Dutch test, I think it was called. And you really need somebody who's quite well-versed in how to read that. It's very complicated when you get the results. Yeah. Um, so I, I yeah. wouldn't really recommend you know, someone try to like order, you know, order it on their own without somebody to help dissect it for them. Kids don't try this at home. Yeah. Or I, um, I mean, I really thought I could interpret those results on my own and I tried and it's, it's pretty complicated. <laughs> no, they're, they're, they're very complicated. I wouldn't say that the book gives you self-diagnosis only because I do think it's important if you really have something going on, that's a bigger diagnosable thing. You do get a formal diagnosis that said, on average in the United States, it takes a woman 9.3 years of going to doctors saying, I've got period pain, I've got constipation, I've got gas and bloating, I've got painful sex, I've got this, I'm, to get a diagnosis of endometriosis. 9.3 years, let's just take that in for a minute. So 9.3 years, five, six, eight doctors, and nobody gives you a diagnosis, or you get a book and you do a self-check, and then you kind of, are self-diagnosing because no one else is doing it for you. Ditto with yeah. polycystic ovary syndrome, ditto with this, that, and the other that women are saying, hey, listen to me, believe me, something is going on, I need answers. And they're just getting, oh, that's normal. Or no, you're fine. Or take the pill. So it really does provide that um, ability to really identify where you are in the, in the sort of scheme of these things, which may lead to a pretty good understanding that, huh, this actually does walk and talk like fibroids. And so I really do need to go and get an actual diagnosis or yeah. maybe you try it on your own for a while because there's nothing life threatening going on. You're like, I'm going to give this a little time and see what happens. So to testing in my medical practice, and I can order tests all I want to, I don't order a lot of hormone testing because there is so much predictability. So if somebody comes in and they say, look, I'm having really irregular cycles, I have a little bit of hair on my chin. I'm having some hair loss. I'm having binge eating. You know, we start doing the checklist. We say if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. So do you need hormone testing for that? No. And certain conditions like endometriosis or PCOS don't have definitive testing that you can get that is either going to give you a certain answer that you do or don't have it or um, like with endo, it might actually take going in for laparoscopic procedure, which does involve anesthesia and, a, you know, being in the hospital and a, and a procedure where tools are going into your belly. So not something to just do lightly. Um, although I do sometimes recommend it. So in my practice, I usually reserve hormone testing for a situation where it's not quite so clear what's going on. One of the times that I would do hormone testing, for example, is when a woman comes to me and let's say she's 39 and she's having hot flashes, and she's having irregular periods, and there's some question that she might be going into premature menopause. And the reason that I would test that and really specifically want to know that is because there are implications medically. So if we go into menopause too early, which is considered under 42 years old, that can have an impact on our bones, our heart, our brain. We might need hormone replacement therapy. Um, another example would be someone who has really been struggling to get pregnant and we want to know what's their ovarian reserve like that. Is their estrogen normal? Is their progesterone normal? Is there something else going on? But for run-of-the-mill hormone problems, I'm actually an advocate of kind of following common sense, following the symptoms. If somebody comes in for PMS or period pain or 
um, you know, any number of things that are pretty obvious as, you know, we say, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. I don't do hormone testing. I think there's an important value to the access that we have now to more home testing, because sometimes doctors are just really resistant to doing some of the more out of the box testing. As you know, I mean, many women experience what look like signs of hypothyroidism and have a hell of a time getting their doctor to do a full thyroid panel. So being able to take that testing into your own hands is really powerful and it can really get you a diagnosis that you might need. On the other hand, this testing industry, this home functional and integrative testing industry is a multi-billion dollar industry that also preys off of our fears and anxieties, this idea that we can biohack everything. And a lot of the testing is not as legitimized or validated as we might hope for. And, you know, we, we've seen it with some of the microbiome testing companies that have gone under where there were less than legitimate practices going with multiple billings to insurance companies. So while I do encourage people to take their health in their own hands, and I think it's important to be a citizen scientist, I think that the over access to medical testing that is kind of unnecessary in a lot of cases more tends to make people anxious or a lot of these testing companies will say, okay, you have this, now let me give you the supplements to support that. And that is a complete conflict of interest. There shouldn't be testing and supplements. Agreed. Tied together. I feel that way too. I've had a couple of people come to me, both private clients, friends, um, where the symptom checklist of like the walk like a duck, talk like a duck, it's mm-hmm. a bit confusing. They have maybe one or two that might scream endometriosis or you know, uh, insulin resistance or PCOS or something, but then like these other ones don't match up and they end up just kind of taking no action because they're a bit stumped. So, you know, what do you recommend for people like that, where it's a bit confusing to not only themselves, but if, if they see a functional or integrative doctor also stumping them? Well, part of the challenge is that hormones have a lot of crossover interactions. So, I mean, let's just look at, you know, we've something we've talked about before, adrenal and thyroid. I mean, if your thyroid is low, you're going to feel tired. You may have some constipation, some hair loss, some depression, some anxiety. You might get sick more often. Your menstrual cycles might be off. But if your adrenal function isn't up to par, you know, you're fatigued, you're also might get sick more often. There are a lot of, you might have irregular menstrual cycles. So there are a lot of crossover symptoms. So I think finding um, almost like a range that tells you yes, something is going on here that's not quite right, gives you a direction that you can move in to then get a concrete diagnosis. Because there are a lot of symptoms that match up with a lot of things, but then there are actually real criteria. Like there are actual criteria for a diagnosis of PCOS. There are criteria for a diagnosis of PMS. But then you look at something like PMS, there are literally hundreds of symptoms, but there are very specific criteria, you know, you meet four of these and you meet five of these, and that is a diagnosis. And then everything else is part of it. Like constipation in and of itself doesn't mean you have a thyroid problem, right? It can mean that you have irritable bowel syndrome. It can mean that you have slow motility. So it's learning to put the right symptoms in the right picture together. And I think that's another challenge. And it's a challenge in creating a book myself is to include enough symptoms that a woman can identify herself in it, but not including so many symptoms that everyone's gonna identify in it. And that's another problem with certain wellness websites. For example, you go and take a quiz and that quiz is literally designed to tell you you have that problem. And then the next step is you get your quiz read out and then you get the supplements that go with it or the tests that go with it because it's literally designed to give you a specific result. I went to a website recently. It's a website that I I love the design of it. And I was looking for how we could create a quiz on my website. So I went to it and this is what I did. I went through every page of the quiz and I didn't answer anything. And then I clicked submit and it gave me a whole printout on what my assessment was. I hadn't clicked anything. And so, you you know, we have to be careful with quizzes too. That's pretty terrifying actually to hear that. Um, Yeah, it wasn't a health quiz. It wasn't a health quiz. It was more like a something else I won't say, but it was, uh, but it was in the health and wellness space. 
Oh God. When people think that they have hormone imbalance, but they're not going to go get formal testing. And let's say they're trying to get pregnant or they are, like you said, thinking they might be going into early menopause or just feeling like they've begun to read and, and get some body literacy and see that these different symptoms they've always had or think are normal are unnecessary and that they could live without them. And so they start to think about rebalancing their hormones. Are there things across the board that you recommend people do to rebalance their hormones? You know, like the same three things, no matter what the actual diagnosis or condition or problem is, or is it very specific to like, if if it's insulin resistance, it's got to be this. If it's estrogen dominance, it's got to be that and, and so on. It's both. Actually, it's a great question. So when I was first proposing this next book to my publisher, I said, what I'd really love to do is a book on polycystic ovary syndrome, then a book on endometriosis, then a book on fertility, and you know, kind of like the arc of what women go through and they're struggling with. And he said, well, what if you did a book on just two of those things? And I'm like, well, that would be a little bit like writing a book on Cuba and Haiti or Jamaica and Cuba. They're both in the Caribbean, but they're very different. He said, well, what would bring it all together? I said, well, if I wrote a book on all the islands in the Caribbean, then I could talk about the impact of, you know, the Caribbean ecosystem, but then talk about how each one has its own flavor, if you will, and its own history and its own politics, et cetera. He said, all right, do that. So in working with women now for 37 years and in my really passionate quest for understanding what are the real factors beyond just saying, oh, it's genetics or bad luck or bad habits that you know medicine might ascribe to why somebody gets sick or has a condition or just has hormone imbalances. Um, what are those underlying factors? And many years ago, that led me to something called exposome medicine. And so it's literally what we're exposed to, like ohm, like the, the realm of what we're exposed to. And exposome medicine is not fringe at all. There is a center for exposome medicine studies at Columbia University, for example. Exposome medicine arose out of environmental medicine, so toxicology and you know, conventional medicine for decades has dismissed the fact that endocrine disruptors are actually doing anything. To the point, let me tell you, when I applied to um, do ob residency at my medical school alma mater, I was interviewed by a gentleman, this is now many years ago, so keep that in mind. I was interviewed by a gentleman who, when he saw my application said, I see that you're interested in studying endocrine disruptors. He said, you don't really believe that BPA crap, do you? And I was like, thank you, yes I do, and I don't think I'm gonna be choosing to go to school here (laughs) for my residency. Interestingly, 10 years later at Yale, in that same department, a gentleman named Hugh Taylor blew open the entire BPA thing. He is head of reproductive endocrinology, and I believe he's now head of obstetrics there. So ironically, at the very same institution that said this is literally, the guy literally at the interview said, you don't believe that BPA crap. I will never forget that. There are just these sentences that stick with you because you're just like, wow, that was shocking. So um, you know, we've been taught that this is crap. I mean, they don't, doctors don't believe it, but in the field of exposome medicine, toxicologists, people like Philip Landrigan, who's the guy who literally got the lead out. He's the guy who discovered that lead was causing brain damage in kids and IQ problems and all kinds of things. People like that have long been under the surface saying, hey, there are environmental factors that really do affect our health, even at nanoparticle exposures. But It's not just endocrine disruptors that we know are leading to, and there's branches that lead up, PCOS and insulin resistance, uh, inflammation and elevated testosterone, endometriosis and immune disruption, period pain and inflammation, pelvic pain and inflammation, fertility challenges in men and women, and the list goes, uterine fibroids, almost entirely dependent on estrogen, and a lot of that estrogen is coming from environmental exposures. But what these folks are also learning is that stress is an environmental toxin. Overuse of antibiotics that affects our microbiome disrupts our hormones. And so this concept of exposal medicine says we have an internal set of ecosystems, our gut, our fundamental uh, resilience based on our childhoods and mental health and all of that. 
and a lot of you know different internal ecosystems. And then we have these external ecosystems like what we're exposed to in the environment, what our diet brings into our bodies, stress, et cetera. And so the premise of the book to answer your question, is there a, you know, a set of common factors literally pulls from this field of medicine and says, here are all the factors that physicians are not taught. I can say that because I am one. We're not taught this stuff. In seven years of medical training, I had 40 minutes, I had a 40 minute class on nutrition. 20 minutes of it was spent with the professor reading a poem he had written. I kid you not. And then the only other mention of nutrition was when I brought greens and millet and things into a public health class to show people, oh, this is what healthy food looks like. So we're not taught this stuff. There's like this whole branch of science and health that's not trickling into conventional medicine that says there are these common set of factors that are affecting us across the board. And depending on who you are, they show up differently. So for me, they might show up in one way. For you, they might show up as endometriosis. For me, they might show up as PCOS. For the next person, they might show up as a fertility problem. So the core of the book is, the, or the core plan is six pillars built around this concept that help us to identify what factors we have in our life. And spoiler alert, most of us have some amount of most of them. And then to answer the second part of that is there are also very specific things that are different if you have a thyroid problem versus if you have endometriosis, versus if you have uterine fibroids, versus if you're having horrible menopausal symptoms, versus if you're having trouble getting pregnant. So there's a whole section of the book that I call the advanced protocols. And it's really just based on literally taking what I do in my medical practice, woman after woman, and saying, look, you know, I could practice medicine 24 seven, and I could train a million practitioners and we'd still not meet all the need out there. Let me put it in a book and let me put this in the hands of women who can make use of this on their own. And of course, there's still need for great practitioners who can guide you, but here's what your doctor doesn't know. Here's what the science shows us and here's why this part is universal and here's why this part is the add-on for you if you need it. So yeah. that's, that's how it works. Oh, that's, that's makes me want to go dive into, I mean, not even having a particular problem. I'm just curious what all the advanced protocols are, but. Yeah. Um, well, and the book isn't just for people who have hormone problems. It's really for anyone with a uterus and ovaries who wants to understand their hormones better, wants to understand their daughter or their sister or their mother's hormones better, and wants to live not just not just take care of a problem, but live a life that is making sure that you are taking care of these six pillars so that you don't have not just hormone problems at some point, but other problems that the hormone problems can be the symptom of, right? So inflammation is a common, I call it the mother of all root causes. We know that chronic inflammation is a trigger for diabetes, heart disease, dementia, and so many problems. But if, as you said, you know, if it's showing up in our monthly periods or it's showing up in a gynecologic problem, it's the opportunity to heal that now. But also if you don't even have any of those problems, it's an, it's an opportunity to learn to live a hormone healthy lifestyle. So you never hopefully have any of those problems. Totally. That's my goal with my work and my, you know, everything I do for myself is always to make sure that something bad isn't going to happen later. <laughs> um, so I want to touch on detox. And I like that Exposome really makes you realize that it's a field of medicine dedicated to things you've been exposed to. And, you know, it's a certainly detoxifying your body um, from things that you've been exposed to is such a wellness buzzword and everybody's detoxing this and that, and you can detox everything indefinitely, but it's also controversial. And I think uh, people, you know, it can be too much how can we optimize our own detoxification pathways to better support our hormone health? Um, yeah. Given that, you know, these toxic exposures are happening at a rate that we've never seen before in history and we can do a lot to reduce them, but they're still coming in, you know, quite rapidly. Yes. And so, you know, to what you said, we can do a lot to reduce them. The way I think about women's health or health in general is boils down to these two questions what am I getting too much of that is putting a burden on my body? In this case, environmental toxin exposures that, as you say, we're all being exposed to. And what am I not getting enough of that my body really needs 
to optimize whatever the pathway is. And there is a chapter in the book, uh, it's called Your Hormones, Our World. And I'm always a little bit hesitant to use the word detoxification because it is so you know, targeted as a buzzword. But we actually do have something called metabolic detoxification. And it's the way that our body takes, breaks down or metabolizes and packages and eliminates all kinds of things. The breakdown products of our own natural hormones, breakdown products of things we're eating in our foods, vitamins and minerals, pharmaceuticals, and then of course the environmental endocrine disruptors that we're exposed to. And we know that you know there are over 80,000 environmental toxins that are also coalescing and forming new environmental toxins that most are not FDA approved or EPA approved. Most of them that were grandfathered in, most have never been tested on pregnant women or women's reproductive health or endocrine systems. And they really are out there and we really are getting exposed to them in our air and our water and our soil and our food and our homes and our internal, you know, carpeting and all the things we have. So reducing those exposures can really do as a form of plasticizer that gets leached out of plastic water bottles, knowing that we can rapidly reduce our exposure. So there's this ingredient called phthalates that we find in plastic water bottles. Um, it's also in a lot of our cosmetics. It creates softness in plastic, but it also is used as fragrance. So a lot of non-organic conventional products that have fragrance are fragranted by phthalates. It's that same air freshener smell that you get in the Uber, for example. Those are usually phthalates coming out of the, of the material. And um, one study showed that just by reducing sunscreen and plastic water and plastic drinking cup use in teenagers for just a few days had a dramatic drop in their blood levels of phthalates. And we know these phthalates affect the hormonal system. So reducing those exposures is really important. But also that detoxification system in your body requires a lot of nutrients. It's, it's completely nutrient dependent. So it needs vitamin C and zinc and magnesium and B complex and something called N-acetylcysteine and glutathione. And it needs sulfur compounds that come from greens and from broccoli and uh, like uh, garlic and onions. It needs all these things that are commonly called antioxidants. And most people are not getting enough of those in their diet to actually keep up with the adequate detoxification that they need even on a daily basis, let alone this excess. So reducing the exposures reduces that overburden, but then providing the body with what the body needs to ramp up that detoxification. And if, if it's just for daily support, you can do it from food and a multivitamin. But if something bigger is going on and you really need to rev up those pathways, then there are different supplements that can be used, botanicals. So curcumin is an example. Taking extra magnesium or B-complex or just a multivitamin can help rev that up. Lots of support that we can do for that. But that's an example of this concept of overburdened and undernourished. And yeah. Really shift I, it. I really like that because I always focused on the you know, uh, eliminating the onslaught that was coming in. And then mm -hmm. it took me something, I don't know, maybe, maybe a conversation like this I had, or just, I don't know what it was, but I thought about the five detox pathways, right? Your, your sweat, your pee, your poop, your breathing and evaluated my own, like, do I do those enough? And what are the things that we know make those either impaired or work really well? You know, like for example, yeah, constipation, requires a mix of plenty of fiber and hydration and this and that. So, you know, you can kind of like work backwards into it. If you're not sure if you have too much excess coming in, you can also think about, well, even if I did, like, am I doing everything to support the mechanisms to go out and then come yeah. at it from both sides? Um, yeah. So I think that's great advice. Um, yeah, and you mentioned fiber, like just as an exam example, right? we know that our ancestors got a hundred grams of fiber. So we talk about like paleo. We know that people in the paleolithic time, they got a hundred grams of fiber a day just from foraging plant material as for their diet. We know that the American Cancer Society says that you have to have at least 30 grams of fiber a day to prevent colon cancer. Any guess on how much the average American is getting? Maybe 30 grams. I would say probably 20. 15. 15 grams a day, 15. the average American is getting in their diet. So half the amount for colon cancer prevention and 
like just you know what eight percent of what our of our ancestors were getting and it's hugely important for hormone health and feeding the microbiome and keeping estrogen levels in balance so you know you can check your estrogen levels sure but if they're high or low it doesn't tell you that much more than if you're having symptoms of it and it doesn't tell you oh uh, is she getting enough fiber? Is she detoxifying well? Is she getting the nutrients she needs? And that's really what that missing link is. And I think I think we know it as women, right? It's why women are turning to alternative sources of information because we know there's something more that our doctors don't know. We just don't always know what to rely on or who to rely on. And so we're like pulling a million pieces of information, but then it's overwhelming and confusing. Should I follow this diet? Should I follow that diet? Should I do this home testing? Should I do that home testing? Should I take this supplement? And kind of what I did in the book is unpack it down to, these are the things that we actually do really know that, are, that will work. And it doesn't mean, we, doesn't mean those other things should be discarded, but if you want a simple core approach that has some validation, this is a great place to start in those six different pillars. And I think even if somebody has gone to get uh, formal hormone testing uh, with a conventional doctor, for example, it's going to tell you, you know, you have high, high estrogen or you have low progesterone or this or that. And then what, but why right. do I have low <laughs> exactly. progesterone and what are they doing or not doing? And so you would need a book like yours or just further information as to how to, you know, optimize and, and balance those hormones. Your book is, like you said, it's not just for people that have actually you know, that have symptoms that relate to certain hormonal conditions, but you know, everyone's tired a little bit here and there from not sleeping enough, or it was hot in the room or these things that aren't necessarily totally. deeply rooted in us. And so how does like the average person tell if they have balanced hormones, you know, it's just like, yeah, a I actually talk about that in the book. Hard. So, I mean, so for example, right. Um, there's a lot on the internet now of like the perfect period color blood is this, the perfect period cycle is this, and it's so much more varied than that. On average, a woman has 400 menstrual cycles in her life. So the idea that you're going to go through 400 periods and never have a lower back ache or never have a cramp or never have a, a crappy day and never feel screaming your head off or what, or never have a, sh you know, a sugar binge, it's, it's not realistic. So really it's like, here's the line of just normal humanhood. And here's the line where it's affecting your life in a negative way. It's actually taking you out of the game. Being a woman shouldn't make you have to take medication every month. Being a woman shouldn't have to make you be unable to show up for work because you feel so uncomfortable. It shouldn't make you not be able to sleep night after night after night because you're having so many hot flashes or it shouldn't make you depressed or anxious just being a woman. But then you say, well, okay, what about being a woman in our culture or being a woman who's getting all these exposures? That's where things get a little wonky. So in the book, I'll say like, okay, look, this is what's completely normal. And yes, if your breasts feel a little full or achy, or if your pelvis feels a little health heavy a couple of days before your period, or if you are craving carbs, like this is why all of that is actually normal. Here's the dividing line. You know your body and you know if something is really taking you out. And that's when, that's really when it's not normal anymore. And that's what a lot of people don't know. Like we're just taught heavy periods that you know, make you have to like bring a change of clothes to work because you're bleeding through two pads or, you know, a tampon an hour. No. Or, you know, just having to like lay out with a hot water bottle for two or three days a month. No, that's, that shouldn't be happening. Or being so fatigued, you can't function or do that graduate program that you want to do all of that. So I really emphasize in the book, not over medicalizing. You know, one of the problems with functional medicine that I've seen, and I, you know, I practice functional medicine, is that you can go to a functional medicine doctor going in thinking, oh, I have like migraines and PMS. And then you come out thinking, oh my gosh, I am so broken. I have detox problems. I have gut problems. I have mitochondrial problems. And we can over medicalize in conventional medicine, but we can also over pathologize in functional medicine. And so this is really about understanding what is biologically um, sort of evolutionarily healthy and how can you get there? And also look, you know, I'm the, always the first one to say a lot of things that women are experiencing now happened to our bodies way before we had any say so and set a permanent imprint. 
So this book is also not about, oh, if you eat the right diet and you do the right herbs, you're going to be healed and fixed. It's about a lifestyle that optimizes, but it's also about meeting you wherever you are. So for example, ibuprofen is great for pain and it can actually help light in a heavy period. But taking ibuprofen month after month after month can actually have physical impacts that are adverse effects. And it still doesn't get to why you're having the period pain month after month. So I'm the first one to say, look, if you have to go and fly from New York to California and you're going to be on a plane for five hours and you're in period hell and you're having a heavy period and you're, you know, having period pain, take the ibuprofen. But let's also figure out why this is happening and what we can do to prevent that need for ibuprofen going forward. Same with the birth control pill. I am not someone who vilifies the birth control pill or using an IUD or even having a hysterectomy if that is going to make your life better and it's something that you want. But it's about all the interventions that medicine doesn't know so they can't tell us that are the lower interventive options that could be taken first in a lot of cases. Right. Right. Oh my gosh. The number of people I know who have had hysterectomies without their physicians trying so many things that could help before that is mind blowing to me. Um, given and not even, not even like natural things, but even like pharmaceutical things that would still be less invasive than having your uterus out. Right. And then they're so surprised when all these, you know, side effects with depression and these other things happen. And it's like, no, this is a major surgery. Like there's, you know, try to do other things before you do that. Um, but I know we're, we're running up on time. So I did want to talk about food and the gut very quickly before we wrap up, because, um, part of your book talks about, you know, eating for hormonal health. And you mentioned it briefly with some of the micronutrients that are critical for, you know, detox pathways and, and detox pathways being an important part of getting rid of Mm -hmm. excess, uh, hormones that would yeah. throw your hormones out of balance. So how important is nutrition in healing hormonal imbalance? And, and then of course, maintaining balanced hormones. I mean, it is the, probably one of the most important things we can do. And you mentioned earlier, you know, like how does food affect the microbiome? Food is the quickest way to disrupt your microbiome and food is the quickest way to heal your microbiome. No pun intended, but it is the lowest hanging fruit that we have and it's so accessible. You know, we have to eat. We're going to eat every day. So let's make the foods that we eat not only phenomenally delicious and nourishing, but also the healing foods that support a healthy microbiome, support giving you the foundational building blocks you need to make healthy hormones. And I am really about non restricting. So in the book, I take out only a very few items that we know can have a big impact on women's hormones health. It's as much about what we add in as what we take away. I'm curious your thoughts on soy, because yeah. that is a very controversial it is. potential hormone disruptor, but soy is also part of the diet of many cultures that are known to be extremely healthy, like the Japanese. Yeah. So soy from a scientific and advanced nutrition perspective is not controversial at all. The Weston Price Foundation made soy the devil and then made soy controversial. Also, non-organic soy is genetically modified and uses glyphosate as one of the major um, herbicide pesticides. So there there are problems with conventional soy. There are problems with the overuse of soy in so many American food products, you know, corn, soy, sugar, these are overused. But from from a perspective of eating soy as a traditional part of the diet, it's like eating lentils or eating garbanzo beans. It's another legume that acts as an important estrogen protector in our bodies. And so having some legumes, I don't care if you don't like soy or you don't want to eat soy, don't eat the soy but then eat lentils, eat garbanzo beans, eat other beans, because those undoubtedly, they have something called resistant fiber, which is so important to feed the microbiome. Every study that's looked at eating legumes in the diet finds that people who even, even if you don't increase your exercise or change your diet too much, otherwise adding a half a cup of cooked legumes three or four times a week. So it could be like, you know, four tablespoons of hummus. It can be a half a cup of lentil soup, better blood sugar balance, less likely to be overweight, but also much healthier estrogen levels. 
So I'm a big fan of it. If you like soy and you want to eat a little bit of tofu in your diet, great, especially if you're vegan, it's a very easy concentrated source of protein. If you want to eat some tempeh, great. Miso is a phenomenal source of lacto-fermented um, organisms. What I do say to stay away from, again, is inorganic soy, any concentrated soy products like texturized vegetable protein or any of the, you know, the fake and bacon, like any of the foods that are supposed to be like the vegan fake meat kind of stuff, that's usually made with soy and a bunch of other things. So if it, if you can't find it in nature, don't eat it. And you can't find vegan as it may be, it's not healthy food. It's not real food. It's still processed food. But, um, and then if you do like soy, the biggest precautions with soy are, um, with dietary soy, eating it a couple of few times a week, there's very little risk. The people who need to be careful are people who, are, who have hypothyroidism and are on thyroid medication. So studies show that if you have hypothyroidism and you eat a small amount of soy in your diet, no issue. But if you're eating a more moderate amount and you're on thyroid medication, it may interfere with thyroid medication. So you either need to skip the soy, the other legumes don't seem to do that, or have your provider, you know, practitioner increase your thyroid medication to compensate. Um, so that may be like if you're vegan and you require tofu in your diet to get enough nutrition and enough protein, then that may be an issue. If you have a history of or currently have estrogen receptor positive cancer, that's where the controversy comes in a little bit, whether and how much you should eat soy. So what we know for those folks, don't supplement with soy products ever and don't eat soy every day. But if you have tofu once a week or once in a blue moon or some tempeh, no problem. But it's when you use it more medicinally or in a concentrated form. Otherwise, the controversy is manufactured and it's not, in my opinion, controversial at all. I have my brother and husband joking whenever I say we're having tofu for dinner, which is usually about once a week or once every other week. Um, and it's always organic tofu, but that they're, they don't want to grow boobs. That's okay. their, you know, it won't make you grow boobs. And I'm always like, where did you get that? Cause it wasn't from me. And you know, if you're hearing that a lot of other people must think that too. When we think about cultural demographics and you think about people who are living in Asia for the most part, there's not as much obesity. You're much likely to see obese men with man boobs. That is a function of dairy products that contain hormones in them. That is a function of being significantly overweight. That is a function of endocrine disruptors galore in our environment. That is not a function of eating soy in the diet, unless you're eating, you know, a diet filled with, you know, fake chicken nuggets and you're getting soy left and right and stuff like that, then that's unhealthy soy and that's getting too much of it. But soy in of itself will not lead to man boobs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My last question for you related to, you know, the gut and, and food is, we know that the gut is very intertwined with hormonal imbalance or hormonal problems, right? Can hormonal imbalance create a gut problem or do gut problems create hormonal imbalance or is it bi-directional is, you know, cause a lot of people I know they're trying to go upstream or go to the root cause and they don't know which one comes first. Yes. So what I would say is gut problems can absolutely create hormonal imbalances hormonal imbalances are more likely to create gut symptoms. So hypothyroid might create some reflux. High levels of estrogen can affect the microbiome. Imbalances in hormones premenstrually can lead to bloating and loose stools. So yes, it is bidirectional. And I think if you were to have a very significant hormone imbalance, then absolutely you could create gut-based problems. But I, I think you see more symptoms and I do talk about that in the book, you know, how your hormones are affecting your gut, how your gut is affecting your hormones. Um, so yeah, um, we know that, for example, the high estrogen in estrogen-based birth control pills can really disrupt the microbiome. So there are incidences where, especially synthetic or high levels of hormones can literally just, just overwhelm the microbiome and change what's growing in the gut. Okay. That's helpful. Um, I never have a good answer for that when people ask me that. Um, okay. So we know all these different things affect um, hormonal imbalance, but after writing Hormone Intelligence um, and from everything that you've seen in all of your you know, work with so many women over, I think you said 37 years, what's the one or, or maybe two biggest things that you see impact hormones across the board? Well, I think the 
probably an obvious one that we've all experienced is stress, right? I mean, we've all, I have, I would imagine you have too, Adrian, had some kind of a stress happen in our life and we skip a period or we have a really irregular period, something happens. So working on, and I know it sounds so simplistic, but there are so many interactions between cortisol and thyroid function and hormones that really looking at our stress levels and how we can kind of ramp those down. And when I say stress, I'm also kind of including sleep in there because stress can affect our sleep, our sleep can affect our stress, and all of that can affect our hormones. And then I would say, um, really right now, probably one of the biggest concerns I have is endocrine disruptors because we're seeing, we're seeing things like puberty starting in girls at six and seven and eight years old. So there's something really insidious happening so anything that you can do, you know, like I don't have, pla I have a glass water bottle I keep on my desk. I don't have any plastic drinking anything in my house. I don't keep my food in plastic containers. My cosmetics are entirely green, clean. And, you know, somebody may say, well, that's expensive. I can't do that. And I will promise you, first of all, you can do it very affordably. I've had the same glass water bottle from the Life Factory company. I don't have a financial relationship with them. I have had the same glass Life Factory water bottle since 2009. You know, it probably cost me 18 bucks when I bought it. I've dropped that on concrete more times than I can tell. That thing went through medical residency with me and I still have it, my red life factory. Um, you can get cosmetics that are very good quality that are non-endocrine disrupting. And if you have to pick and choose, do the things that you put all over your body, your soap, your shampoo. Obviously, you don't put your shampoo all over your body, but when you're washing your hair, it gets all over your body. Your soap, your body lotion, your foundation, your lipstick, because we're like constantly eating our lipsticks off of our lips. And think about your household cleaners, anything that you can really kind of up level in terms of ecologically friendly can make a huge, huge difference in your life. And not only that, then we're doing something really good for the planet that can have a sea change effect that can help the next generation to have fewer exposures. You know, it's just considered the new normal that girls are developing breasts at that age. Kotex de developed a whole line of menstrual pads for girls who are eight years to 10 years old with hearts and stars and unicorns. This is not an acceptable new normal. And we know that that is the result specifically of endocrine disruptors in our food. Um, in our homes and our things that we're putting on our bodies. No, and it's so hard for women to grasp when you when they come to you, and I mean, so many women come to you so desperate or write to me and you know looking for some advocacy help, but you know, point me in the right direction. So desperate, and when they hear things like, "Okay, you've got to get the plastic away from your food," they're like, "What?" that's what's causing all this, you know? And, and of course it's a combination of things, but there, it's almost like they want something more dramatic from, from me. Oh, I mean, you can imagine people come to me, right. They're like, wait, that's what I paid you the big bucks for to tell me to like, you know, eat more kale and, and not use plastic containers. I'm like, I will honestly tell you, I'm not uh, someone who's like neurotic or compulsive about things. If I'm with my grandkid and it's Halloween and my grandkid's giving me a little mini Snickers bar, I'm not going to be like, ew, I don't eat that. I would eat it. But when it comes to my commitment to that interface between my responsibility for the environment, the planet that we live in and what is going in and on my body, I am like, literally, I like zero compromise. You probably couldn't find any plastic wrap bags containers. Uh, if I can avoid buying any food in plastic, I don't. And I just think that it does take a little more work, but once you get used to it, it's a way, it's just a way of life. It's not actually that big a deal. And I will also tell you, we raised four kids like this, my husband and I, on a school teachers and home birth midwife salary. And this was back in the day when home birth midwives made like $450 for all the prenatal care and all the births. So um, there are ways to do it affordably. And it's such an important thing that you can do for yourself, but also for if you're going to get pregnant someday for your children, because we accumulate these things in our bodies and such a powerful way to raise our kids as sort of eco warriors, as just like a family thing that you do, or, you know, if you do it for yourself. So um, it's kind of like living as close to zero waste as you can, but also really having that commitment to yourself to a return to nature. You know, if we're out of balance, how do we expect our hormones to be in balance? Our hormones are just a reflection of that environment that we live in. And so 
those are my two biggest things. And you know what? Taking care of stress isn't just for your hormones. It's because you deserve you deserve to live a life where you feel really good about your life. And that's another thing as women, we often don't give ourselves permission to do. I would very much agree with all of that. And I'm glad to hear that this whole idea that, you know, you've got to get rid of these plastics and things like this are uh, being validated by somebody like you, because I feel sort of silly sometimes telling people that that's a first step before they can figure out what's going on with their fertility or their endometriosis. Well, I mean, look, Adrian, that guy who told me the whole thing, like, you don't believe in that BPA crap, do you? When Hugh Taylor blew open the BPA stuff, however many years ago it's been now, two states immediately took BPA, not only out of um, packaging that was being sold, but out of things like the receipts that you get when you go to the grocery store or the airline tickets. Why? Because it was such a significant endocrine disruptor that it was found to be affecting women's fertility. And who's handling most of the grocery receipts? Women. Who's handling most of the pharmacy receipts? Women. Who are most airline personnel who are handling tickets and handing them out and taking them all day? Women. And so two states literally banned their inclusion in things that women were handling all day or told people to wear gloves because they were so significant. So to me, it's huge. I wish more than two states did that immediately. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's grown. I don't know how a tally of all the states now, but uh, Connecticut and California, uh, and of course Yale is in Connecticut, so maybe that was why, but they immediately went to, nope, these have to come out of the things that women are having chronic exposure. And of course, there are still lots of women who are working at jobs that have terrible you know, environmental standards who are getting exposed to these kinds of things all the time. But, um, but just to, just to your point, you know, people believing it, it's like, y'all, this is real. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Well, thank you. This has been super, super informative and I can't wait to get my hands on uh, hormone intelligence and optimize mine and postpartum. I think it's going to be very important for me and the entire pregnancy journey uh, has really opened my eyes to not only fertility issues, but a lot of the hormonal conditions that are upstream from that, right? Because infertility itself is not a condition. It's, you know, it's, it's what's causing that. So when people are going upstream, they're then finding these PCOS, endometriosis, things like that. Um, so I've seen so many people struggling, really close friends and people in the wealthy community. And it seems, you know, at that point, they're really rushing to try to have a baby and, and, you know, it takes time for your body to properly detoxify and get these things out. So um, the good news though, is that our bodies are so phenomenally capable it's really just, again, a matter of stripping away what's overburdening and replacing what our bodies need that we've traditionally, until 70 years ago, 80 years ago, we were getting from our food, we were getting from our you know, lifestyles, and we're just not now. Yeah. Great. Well, I hope anybody that is interested in optimizing their hormones grabs Aviva's new book, Hormone Intelligence. And thank Great. you so much again. Aviva is all over the place, but why don't you tell us where to get this book and where to find you and things like that? Yeah. So you can get the book anywhere you get books, but when you do get your book, go to avivaram.com forward slash book, just the word book. And you will find a page where you can actually register your proof of purchase, like a screenshot from where you got your book or a receipt and upload it. And then you will get all these incredible gifts, including if you get the book by June 8th, my entire 28 day got reset completely free. So that's an, it's an amazing program talking about the importance of gut and hormones. And then you can come hang out with me on my Instagram. It's doctor dot. So like a period um, of Eva Ram. And I've got all kinds of stuff going there in the feed and stories and IGTV, some goofy reels that are informative, but fun. And so yeah, hang out with me on my website. Once you go to vivaram.com book, you'll be in my website. So you can see all the cool articles and videos and free downloadables. There's tons of stuff for you there. So Definitely. enjoy it and thank you. Thank yes. you for having me. Absolutely. I love following you on Instagram and I like your new, your new reels. They're great. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been wonderful. Thank you again. And uh, thank you everybody for joining.